This recording may contain content unsuitable for children. Hey everybody and welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm your host Will. And I'm your host Brian. And I'm your special guest Jake. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons from archaic architecture to aberrant arachnids and today we're talking about world building. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> I cast Fireball. The Dungeon Cast. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about world building. That's from a DM standpoint. Uh, what do yep. we got going on with that? So when you're getting ready to Dungeon Master your first session, you kind of have two options. Um, you can go with like a pre-generated campaign setting. It can be something like Dragonlance or uh, Forgotten Realms or something like that. Or you can go the creative route and kind of create your own campaign setting. And with that, it means you have to build your whole, your your own entire world. And that can entail uh, a lot of things. It could be as simple as like you just create like a, a region or a country in which like this is all taking place and you never really venture outside that or it could be something along the lines of an entire planet if you will and the realms outside of that planet like there's the sky's the limit and you can build whatever you want it's it's the it's the place where you can get the most creative as a dungeon master i would think so will you've had experience uh creating worlds before um how many how many games have you run where you've created separate worlds for them um let me see. Ah, oh, man, I've ran so many games. It's been years, years of gaming. Um, for the last three years, I have been running all my games within the same world that I have created. It's a, it's the same world that you guys are playing in right now, AS Mara. Um, I actually, for the first year and a half of running games in this world, it all occurred. All my games occurred on a completely separate continent, like across the ocean that you guys don't know anything about. And for this game, I decided to take this kind of elsewhere and go across the ocean and play in a, a new area. So you have a, a whole entire world that you built, and yep. you just get to divide it up and uh, play your games like you like just how you said. You have different continents, you have yep. uh, different cities, and lots of different people that inhabit the world. Different and, countries, uh, different cultures, different everything. So that's like a like a myriad of options for you just to. Uh, have at your disposal to place characters in any kind of setting you really want, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, I definitely use it as such. Um, so yeah. is your map on ASMR now, is it filled out with uh, like predetermined places, or are there empty areas that you would fill out depending on your needs? It's got both. Um, so, for instance, the area where you guys are, the Isles of Erythia, um, there are many countries that I've, I've divided out and they got like their capitals and major cities and I got all that plotted out and I have them all named but um, I don't have too many of the details fleshed out unless you guys have been there because you know world's a big place and like some some DMs got the creativity and what it takes to like get every minuscule detail down of every aspect of their world and they just build it brick by brick by brick but for me it's more along the lines if I have a general idea of where all the pieces go, and as you guys explore, we start filling in the details together. Now, one thing I'll say about my world is my world is an amalgamation of all the different fantasy books and like um, readings and movies and all my different inspirations. And I've kind of just cherry-picked all the things I really liked and kind of crafted this world that just has all of my favorite stuff. So this is a real like Will-branded fantasy <laughs> I would say like a good place to start when it comes to building your world is um, making a map. Just make a like a rough map, whether you sketch it out or you use um, – there are some cool online tools that are free. Um, Incarnate is a really good one. That's one I actually use to build AS Mara. And just kind of like build the land masses and just kind of like sculpt it out and just see where it all goes. And once you have that, once you have all your land masses shaped out, you can then start filling in like the terrain and the environment – and then you'll start getting inspiration for like cities and whatnot. Um, what about the um, the details surrounding not just your map, but like where did you get into like? Do you have like a creation story and like? I do. You know, I do. Um, so so you would start with building a map and then kind of fleshing out the terrain and stuff, or would you start with would you start with like a creation story or like? Like, what's the very first step? Is it map building? Well, the first step can be whatever you want it to be. So for me, it was map building. Um, I started with uh, a couple maps. I just kind of fleshed it out, started putting cities where I wanted them to be, Um, having ideas for basic, like, cultures, like, 
ideas for like a holy empire, um, ideas for, you know, like, uh, um, a city that's, uh, ran primarily by like an assassin's guild and so on and so forth. And just kind of take these basic concepts, put them in places and then flesh them out either then or later. Um, I kind of backtracked from there to get to my whole creation story because I started having to populate my world with deities because deities, as you both know, like really heavily come into play in this game. Um, especially, I mean, you, they have to. You have classes like paladins and clerics that they actively get their powers from some sort of god that they worship. So I uh, I reskinned some deities from other settings. I came up with some of my own um, and I formed my pantheon. And then I had to ask myself the question, well, where did these guys even come from? So, and then I just kind of kept going back and back into the histories and eventually I created the whole creation myth of, the cre- the creation mythos of A.S. Mara. That's cool. It's like building in reverse. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, whatever whatever you want to do, you could start from the creation myth or you could never even go back that far. Like, it's, it's up to you. Uh, when you have players running around, uh, do you so you have ideas for like predetermined places that you've built? Do you ever mm-hmm. find yourself moving them around? Like, um, I haven't. No, yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure it happens. But that is, that's the thing. Like, um, before you get started with your campaign, like you can shuffle everything, anything wherever you want it to be. But like once you've built the map and you have it labeled and you bring it to the game, well, where things are, where they are, and you, they can't really change. Uh, character building, or I guess like. NPCs is something I'm kind of having trouble with with my yeah. per- with my world right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of seems daunting to kind of try to make up all these people and this this diverse population that you're going to have to make this fill this world in. Right. Yeah. Um, what were some of I guess the difficulties you had with making <clears throat> a population? I guess um, when it comes to uh, so do you mean like more like individual NPCs? Yeah, like the people that these players are going to be interacting with. Right. That it is some of the more, most difficult stuff for me. Um, actually, the hardest part for me when it comes to NPCs is naming them. I'm fucking terrible when it comes <laughs> to names. And thank God none of you guys read much fantasy literature because most names in my world are blatant ripoffs. <laughs> Wait, I, don't, I think <laughs> you should really stop stressing about it because we we just we won't ask you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's a joke. We don't ask any any of uh, Will's NPCs' names. And yeah, I think it really pisses yeah. him off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm over it. It's going to get you guys in trouble one day, I'm sure. But we'll see what happens. <laughs> Hopefully, um, we'll be better about it. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, I, I'm not sweating it. But I, um, I have problems. Yeah. Um, so, so you're you're an experienced world builder. Uh, you have a very like. Uh, it seems to me like you have a pretty established um, environment going on. Yeah. Um, I'm currently in the middle of building a brand new environment for a game that we plan on running online um, for everyone to watch. So keep keep a keep a listen out for that. But um, yeah, I'm 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 kind of like, well, do I, I I have ideas for places that I want to build. OK. Um, and the things I want going on there. Mm-hmm. And for the beginning of the session, it's pretty easy because I can I can plop you guys down wherever. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'd have to talk about it. But yeah, we can we can get you guys all to the same location. But after that, you have all the freedom in the world to go where you please. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, OK, do I just make the map and where they go is where they go? And the story will be decided by that. Or do I um, do I let the players wander and do I just kind of put an NPC that I want them to meet in their path? Like, is that something you're going to do both? I mean, D&D is a little bit about. Or it's a lot of it about letting the players do what they want and go where they want. You can't dictate where they're going to go outside of like super railroading them. But at the same time, you're going to give them that illusion of choice where the players decided to go to a certain area. And in the area, they met an NPC that you always were going to have them meet. It didn't matter where they were going to go, but they don't know that. So you, so it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They're going to have both the freedom of choice and at times the, the illusion of a choice that isn't really a choice. Okay. Um, so you're going to do both and you're going to do both a lot and it's going to mix and mingle. And uh, as a DM, you want to kind of keep that under wraps when you do those. Kind of yeah. Things, right? You know, you yeah. You don't want them seeing behind the curtain, you know? Yeah. And then they know they, that, they um, see how messy it is back there and it is quite messy. Maybe I assure the choices you. you make aren't necessarily your choices, but you you thought that they were at the time. And it yeah. I, I feel like it would ruin the game if I told somebody like, mm. no, nah, that was going to happen no matter what. Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, don't do that. That ruins the immersion. <laughs> um, I actually find myself doing that less and less over the years of DMing. Uh, 
mostly part of it is I don't have a lot of time as much time as I would like to to prep. So a lot more and more of my sessions become more off the cuff. Just what happens happens. I don't even know what's going to happen next session. So cool. So Jake, you're thinking about building a world. Um, what are some of the ideas you've got going on for that? Uh, you know, I'm pretty into dinosaurs. If anybody knows me. Well, good news for you. The <laughs> new Volo's Guide of Monsters, which I got the copy of right here, has like a whole plethora of dinosaurs in it. Like, no joke. Oh, that's sick. I didn't like, know that. Yeah. As, as enemies or? Yeah, as monsters. Oh, okay. But you have that's lizard amazing. folk for a little temple if you want dino people. Wasn't the bar, um, what was it, uh, the bugbear? Bugbear, yeah. That was a creature before it was a race, right? Yeah, exactly. So true. Um, people running bugbears actually. Um, you got an option now. Yeah, they, they, they've got the option. So I'm, I'm sure that you could do the same thing for the dino people that. What uh, people were doing for the bugbear, which is just take the creature mold and, and build it as a race. So, know? what was your idea with the dino people? Uh, it was going to be something like uh, there would be, you know, 65 million years ago, sort of thing, like a Pangaea sort of continent. And then um, the original idea, the one that me and Brian talked about, was like some sort of arc from the future would come and it would have all of the classic races on it. Okay. That. A regular fantasy game would have like elves, dwarves, pretty much, yeah. yeah. And then they they land, dinosaurs don't end up dying. They pretty much end up being like kind of the indigenous species, mm-hmm. and then the world progresses. And then all these fantasy characters are making their world and living in this world where dinosaurs are just all already there. Mm-hmm. And so that was going to factor into kind of the character creation. I was kind of going to um, reskin like a dragonborn and mm-hmm. make make it instead like a dinosaur born and like whatever one you okay. choose. Like if you want to be like a triceratops, it'll be like a tricera born or like a stegosaurus. And it'd be like, like humanoid sort of dinos. Yeah. Gotcha. Pretty That's pretty cool. That's and pretty then, cool. you know, that would progress. Yeah. Well, lucky for you, this book has lizard folk, which are probably pretty close. They're going to at least have some ideas. that I'm sure you could find some use out of also, um, this book has kobolds, which are like small dragonling type humanoids. So mm. you might be able to use that as well. Um, I know that, Will Wheaton has his own custom campaign setting called The Ashes of Alcana. Who's and Will Wheaton? Will Wheaton, Will Wheaton he's, a, he's an actor. He's a internet uh, personality. He's got a show called Tabletop on YouTube. He's really cool. He used to be part of a D&D par- podcast called Acquisitions, Inc. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan. But he has a, uh, a campaign setting called The Ashes of Alcana, which takes place in like a cyberpunk slash fantasy world. And in that world, there are, are a race of beings called Saurians. Who are basically dino people? Mm. It's it's a different. Um, it's not fifth edition D anD D, so I don't know how the mechanics would kind of move over. But you might want to check something like that out. It might give you some ideas. Yeah, definitely. That yeah. sounds that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. And that's the thing when you're building your world, like use all the inspiration from all the areas of your life that you can, because um, it's it's only going to help. And it's going to help you flush out a really unique world that's really your own. And uh, I've played in a lot of games, and no campaign setting has been alike when it comes to a custom campaign setting. And it's always wild and crazy to see what other people come up with because it's always something that you just never would have thought of. Have you been, um, have you been a part of a game that is using a, like, like the, um, the dragon Lance campaign setting or something like that? Um, Oh, you mean like a, a formal pre-made setting? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't think I really have. I've listened to podcasts that, that do, um, Acquisitions Inc. for for example takes place in Forgotten Realms nowadays, and uh, I've heard some Dark Sun campaign settings, and they seem really cool. Um, I'm just not really into uh, delving into a pre made setting because like it has the opposite effect, I think, of what's intended when it comes to pre made settings, where it's like if you don't feel like coming up with all your own stuff, you don't have to. Here's some pre made stuff. For me, the effect it has on me is like, oh man, I gotta go learn all this stuff that like someone else made up. I have to memorize the yeah. map. How am I gonna like retain all this information that I don't care about nearly as much as I would my own stuff? So I just usually don't touch that stuff. So that's cool. I, yeah, I really like um, all the freedom I get with building building a map. I've been having a lot of fun drawing and like you can get into the like really gritty details yeah. like uh, plant life, animal life, um, the terrain, mm-hmm. the, the trails that are going through like mountains. It's just think about um, like looking at Google Earth and zooming in and zooming in and zooming mm-hmm. in yeah. and then trying to like scroll along the ma- the world at that point, like in Street View. 
and trying to like navigate your neighborhood, it takes forever, right? Yeah. So, um, what, do you think it's worth? Uh, I think for towns, it's probably worth like kind of having a layout like street by street, and yeah. in case people at least some main thoroughfares and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, but for like uh, maybe like wild areas, like um, big big uh, open landscapes with not a lot of things around, how how much planning do you do as far as like the map itself? Uh, when it comes to like open wilderness, yeah. uh, minimal. I would say I have a general idea for like the type of creatures around, the type of plant life, like the weather. Uh, a few landmarks. I might even have uh, like some tables ready, some random tables to like, okay, what happens? And I roll on the table and something random happens. Um, and then I just leave the rest up to you guys, which, and, and that's the thing, like you can't control where your players go. So when you create this world, a lot of it will go unexplored. Like sometimes your some of your favorite parts of the game, some of your favorite things on the map that you made will never get touched. And you got to be okay with that as a DM. Um, but also, on, on the kind of the flip side of that is because your players are going to be the ones exploring your world, they're also going to be the ones kind of defining uh, what's important in your world or defining like the details of stuff you never thought of before. Because the players are going to ask, well, I want to, I, I, I need to visit the blacksmith like desperately because of such and such reason. And you actually forgot to come up with the NPC for that or you, you didn't even think about a blacksmith and now on the fly you got a new NPC you got to name him you got to give him personality and next thing you know he's integral to your storyline this guy never existed before yeah all of a sudden um, he's very critical to the so, party they're going to remember him for helping them out and exactly stuff. or you know or it'll just be like a funny run in like when with you and Seward the Strange that's right I was just yeah. about to bring up Seward yeah. the Strange because it sounds exactly like the scenario <laughs> yeah we get to our first town my character goes into the town he's like hey where's the blacksmith I want to go say what's up to that guy and make my presence known and you were like how can i help you oh shit (laughs) did you roll his name i think um yes i i rolled his name it was seward which i thought was a strange name and then i was like oh i'll call him seward the strange we like our alliterations here and and then you spoke to him i was like okay well what makes him strange i go he'll just talk fucking weird and i started screaming (laughs) and and an awkward man yeah it was it was pretty funny um you didn't help me at all no like basically nothing actually came of that interaction (laughs) I was um, like, peace out. I'll see you later. Like, uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> I won't, though. Um, but yeah, so uh, so the players kind of, well, I mean, it, obviously this depends, but in my style of DMing, the players actually end up writing a lot of the world unwittingly. Um, we're, we're, um, while we're on like NPCs and stuff, um, so you, you're, you're going to have like dragon people in your world and uh, like lots of the classics are going to be there, you know? Um, are you going to have. Like what's what are you thinking about your towns? Like how are they going to look generally with like most of your most of your um, your humanoids being like dragon skins and stuff, or uh, or dinosaurs? Uh, you know, I I thought about just keeping it kind of classic. I mean, I I I, I, I also kind of feel like it's a cop out, <laughs> but I kind of just kind of want to keep it within the fantasy realm. So it's just I like, mean, there's still humans, there's still orcs, there's still <clears throat> dwarves, like that sort of thing. Like they went and they made their classic you know town still yeah. yeah like it's just it's in this dinosaur-esque also world so yeah we'll, so are most people are most people going to be dinosaurs or are they are they gonna, is it going to be a nice blend i feel like it'll be a it'll be a hot blend i mean there'll be still just <laughs> straight purebred dinosaurs like how we see them but then there'll also be oh, lines of them that evolved into kind of like what is it like homo reptilia sort of thing yeah, like like more advanced like those will be kind of like the the dinosaur born and i'm just gonna have everybody else in there okay. too just to kind of make it cool and just if somebody else wants to play a specific race they can yeah because yeah. you're gonna have people playing you you're, you're you're sitting down to play D, so like if somebody wants to run a rogue you'll have that option yeah exactly and that's i mean that it I feel like just having the dinosaurs in there is just an added thing. Like, you know, if there's maybe like that's like, the flavor. Right? Yeah. Like somebody has like somebody's like part of like a cavalry, like instead of a horse, like they can ride like a triceratops or something like that. Like that was just, you know, just some ideas I was kind of fooling around with. Well, and here's something else you got to think about, too, is you said in this world, uh, in this world, obviously, the dinosaurs didn't go extinct, which means there was no extinction event. Which means, like, the whole climate of the world didn't go through this massive tragedy. So, exactly. like, are we talking, like, still, like, a, I don't know, like, a, a 
yeah, high prehistoric, oxygen, big, in, big yeah, insects prehistoric, and like, like hey, that's kind of uh, cool for monsters. Flora and fauna, like, uh, that's kind of cool to explain monsters and stuff because like the the big insects from that era are from like high oxygen. Yeah, levels, so, yeah. Like, you could just have monsters that are skin that has like giant spiders and stuff, which yeah. already exist, but like now you have like an now in, it makes a little bit an more in sense. Yeah. reason yeah. to have them be huge, <laughs> you know. Or you hand wave it. Magic. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> Just because. Um, you know, and then, of course, you got to start thinking about who these Saurians are. I, I'm calling them Saurians. Who these dino people are and uh, their own culture. Because you have no basis. Like, with dwarves, it's easy. You can just go the cliche route. Or yeah. same with elves. But, like, with these dino these dino boys, you're going to have to be coming up with something on your own. That is true. And, you know, I've, I've tried to put as much thought into it as I can. But, you know, I don't know if this game is ever going to come to be. But I think I'm still going to you know, build the world because it seems like a lot of fun just to build this just in case. Yeah, it is. And then, uh, you know, that's the thing too, when you're building the world, uh, you have to build the world, but then you have to think about all the other aspects of the game, um, and how they play. Like there's more than just the mortal realm. Yeah. There's where does your heaven come into play? Does the abyss exist? And like, what's that like the nine hells, you know, the shadow fell, the, the Feywild, uh, the elemental planes, like the where far, does that all uh, the far realm? The far yeah. Realms, yeah. Where, do, where does all that come into play? Is it classic? Is it changed? Do you scrap some of it? Do you keep other stuff? Like it's all up to you. The, Whatever you like. That's true. Will I, the beholder rear its ugly face? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't feel like it's a, a Dungeons and Dragons game if there's not the fear of a beholder or of a dragon. Yeah. So that's something I do that's want to incorporate. It just I don't know how to incorporate it. I mean, there's freaking dinosaurs that evolve, so it's not like it's that practical. Or anything like that, but yeah. it's it's definitely something I want to think about and get in there. So there's a there's tons of decision making that you have to do um, based off of like let's talk about town building towns and cities. Mm-hmm. Um, so for a world like yours, Jake, um, you're you're thinking of keeping it like a medieval style, uh, a classic like um, they build with wood and uh, and brick and mortar and things like that. Yeah, stone, stone, stone. Yeah. Um, uh, well, what do you, what do you what do you have going on in your world in terms of um, like how your how your towns and cities came to be? Because Baron's Gate is a pretty sophisticated place. I think maybe we should talk. about Yeah, that a yeah, bit. it is. Um, that's the thing with my world. My world it's a very old world. Um, you guys don't really know this in character, but you guys are actually in the fifth age of this world, and I have a basic history set out uh, before that, which I'm not going to get into. But um, like for me, like a lot of the cities are are really really old, and some of the magic, not really tech, but some of the magic capabilities that it took to build some of these like great landmarks, those those don't those means don't exist anymore. Um, so there are certain wonders of the world. For instance, the Baron's Gate has the wall made out of a um, an alloy blend between stone and adamantium, and uh, it, it can't be made anymore. Uh, what's adamantium for people that aren't familiar? It's actually adamantine. Adamantium is what Wolverine has coated on his bones, but uh, it's the same shit, whatever. Um, adamantine is just a mythological metal that's like really heavy and unbreakable. It's like the strongest metal in the world. There's all kinds of like mythic metals in D&D. There's like mithril and oracalcum and, uh, the, you know, the list goes on. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of that going on in the world. And for me, I like that because I feel like it adds some mystery to ASMR. It adds some depth. Like you guys as characters and well, you guys as players know, like your characters are in this time period, but there was stuff before a lot of it. And, there, you know, you don't know most of it, but it's there. Um, I've also had ideas of like taking this world and just advancing it like 10,000 years into the future and kind of running like a cyberpunk fantasy kind of amalgamation where like there's like laser blades and like pis- uh, laser pistols and like all kinds of cool tech and stuff but uh we'll see if i ever get around to doing that yeah i've got some ideas for my world where um it's built uh it's post post apocalyptic so the world ended and uh in a way and people uh people survived and uh continued civilization and then thousands of years later uh is when i'm going to set the campaign and uh, so there's old tech that would be familiar to like um, an out of character person um, no. that would uh, you could come across in the world and it's probably not working anymore, but um, maybe it will be like I um, I was talking to Jake uh, a few days ago about uh, or was it yesterday about um, uh, I call it the scenario finding the Jeep. <laughs> yeah, and, that was uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, when you guys if. When I run my campaign, you guys will be in a scenario where you find the Jeep, quote unquote, which is like 
you your party of adventurers comes across like an ancient vehicle. It'll be a jeep or like a you know think of Jurassic Park without the the top on it, like yeah. a rover, mm-hmm. and um, maybe you guys can get it running. And uh, my world is going to be really big, so maybe you can drive for uh, take a couple days of uh, adventuring off the clock, and just you know. Uh, it might only have like a quarter tank of gas or whatever, but that's it will be priceless. I feel like. Oh um, yeah, definitely stuff like that. Um, it's magic talk- that's not magic. Yeah, you were <laughs> talking about your Warforge that can like do futuristic things like that, like oh, reanimate yeah. machinery yeah. and things. And I was like, oh man, I really want to fucking do that. With that <laughs> stuff. That's cool. Would you say that was uh, kind of a, a inspired by uh, your reading of um, the Dark Tower trilogy, where it's oh, like yeah. post-apocalyptic kind of? Kind of. I haven't read it. You've only I've only heard what you've told me about the series. So yeah, the world has like a it's it's very old, and um, when you pick up the book, it, it's very clear that the world is dying, mm, okay. and um, you're coming to the tail end of um, all of these um, resets, like. Um, you know, they come across old tech. They the like paper is very very valuable because no one makes it, and there's a finite amount, and it's very limited. Um, things like uh, precious metals are hard to come across, and alloys they're not made anymore. You got what you got. Um, the tech isn't good enough, and no one's creating anything new because not only is like the world dying that that encompasses almost everything. Like people's energies are dying, and like mm-hmm. renovations aren't being made to like. Um, long-standing cities and they're kind of just everything's just falling into ruin no one knows how to rebuild um yeah so it's 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 definitely a draw from that like they come across batteries and lanterns and electric lights are like oh yeah i ha- I saw those when i was a kid in my hometown but you know that's been fucking forever since i've been there and stuff like that right and so it, it's very uh mystical it's almost like magic gotcha um, there's like fall nuclear fallout that has like come and gone and right like mutant creatures and things like that so um, yeah, that, that's something I want to play around with too. Maybe not exactly like that. Maybe um, my world won't be dying. My world right. will be in one of the one of a of many resets. Like how you're saying, your world has like a rich history of resets. Yeah. So. And and that's the thing. And and again, in my world, there was a cataclysmic event two ages ago that you guys might not know about, and it changed the face of the planet. And blah 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 blah. I would say when it comes to uh, starting on world building. Um, kind of what I'm seeing from both of you guys is choosing a theme. You guys kind of both chose a, a theme and then built from there. Like you chose like a dinotopia type world and mm. you went like with a post post apocalyptic thing. And that's the thing. There's all kinds of themes you can choose from from cyberpunk to steampunk to old old school like swords and sorcery style where it's like um, maybe uh, like there isn't a lot of metal in the world. So this is pre medieval times. This is before nights. This is like barbarians and like dark sorcery and stuff like real primitive type things and there's just you know an endless amount of themes that you could choose from yeah, i like uh i like ideas um with my with my post post apocalyptic thing the apocalyptic event could be anything um but what i really like is people fucking around with magic like in a real bad way mm-hmm. and that can be um like there are things like uh like arcane cores and stuff like that mm-hmm. um can like go haywire explode cause like um I think, Will, you were telling me about, um, like, natural disasters, that magic and, like, uh, you know, it's treated like radiation almost. Like, it could fuck, like, nature up and stuff yeah. if it's just let loose. And that's up to the DM. Like, you, that's that's the thing. You decide how magic works in your world. And, like, yeah, that can totally be a thing. Sick. I love that. <laughs> hey, everyone. We wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for listening. We really appreciate your support. If you like what we do here at the Dungeon Cast, please spread the word and tell your friends about us. You can find us on soundcloud.com slash the dungeon cast on iTunes or click the link in our description to hear us on YouTube. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have a question, suggestion, or you just want to say hi, feel free to leave a comment. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at the dungeon cast or send us an email at the dungeon at gmail.com. That's it for the break. Enjoy the rest of the show. So you'll find when as you continue to build your world like piece by piece whether you're building cities or uh, continents caves forest whatever you're going to end up learning a lot more than you ever thought you probably would have about how terrain works and environments work and whatnot like i can't like i swear every other session uh along the game like something will come up and i'll be like man i don't actually know how ships work in real life let me look that up real quick yeah so like dming is a learning experience for real life too it's actually kind of crazy yeah, you want to put um like uh like in a natural setting, do you, what kind of flowers are there? 
Do you, right. Do you know what kind of sunlight they need? Does it yeah. make sense for them to be there? Or is, does any of that even matter to you? Is right. does that matter to your game? How, it may or may not. What scale are do you want to build the world to? It's up it's up to you. Yeah. Because who knows, you might have a character that likes nature and likes uh Maybe like Rosden, he um, he's looking for like plants to make um, like band aids and like poisons yeah, pan- and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, panaceas and, and poultices and uh, um, poisons and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's something that a character might want to do in your world, and you're gonna have to accommodate them. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's the thing. Like your players again. Here we go. They're dictating the content of your world and what matters and what you got to learn and what you got to put in their in in the place. So that brings so. us to a good place of um, when you're going to run your world is how important is it for you to get to know your uh, not only your players, but the characters they're going to be running in your world? Oh, I think it's paramount. You got to, because like this is their game and you're damning it for them. Your job is to make sure that they are having fun. So you have to cater to them. I mean, you're not going to pander to them, but you're going to cater to their strengths and you're going to play with their weaknesses. But you got to understand both and you got to, you got to give them, um, you got to play with, you gotta you gotta work with their goals. You gotta work with what they want to work with, and uh, and if you do that, you're you're gonna have a blast. Yeah, it's easy to it's uh, your characters will surprise you it's, all the time. It's nothing that you're gonna be able to avoid. No matter how much prep work you do, you're gonna run across something that is gonna throw you for a loop. So you need to, as a DM, you need to be adaptive, and your world needs to be able to change to fit the needs of what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, I also don't, I wouldn't stress about it if you're new to DMing, like it all comes with time and like, there's no better way to learn to think on your feet than just having to in the moment and, uh, you get better at it and it it just becomes a lot of fun. A few things I'm having problems with. Um, one of them is, uh, measuring distances. Mm -hmm. I found out how very, very terrible I am at that. (laughs) Um, I do not know what 50 feet looks like in my brain. Uh, I know the concept of 50 feet exists and like (laughs) 30 foot cubes and what 60 feet like I just have so much trouble like how big is this room Uh, I don't fucking know Uh, 60 feet damn that's huge like oh shit okay maybe it's 30 feet yeah sorry (laughs) yeah I guess you know what I'm pretty good when it comes to like scale and like measurements so I've never had that issue so I don't even know like when Um, when it comes to like measurements on the world map that I have what I do generally is I'll, I'll I'll break out like a tape measure and like I'll pick two cities on a continent and I'll have an idea in my head of how far away they should be based off like the size of the US where like New York and LA that's 3000 miles so like for uh for you guys uh, Barons Gate between between Barons Gate and the Witchlight Fens way way down in the south I had a general idea for how far that was I broke out the tape measure measured how far that was in inches and just kind of converted it and then with that I can tell how far anything else is from each other um, so that's how I do that with world maps. So, a uh, quick secret for naming stuff, like when you're populating your world. Oh yeah, please do tell. <laughs> um, I go back to um, things that I've just anything I've seen where like there is a world that exists, like uh, Legend of Korra, Avatar: The Last Airbender, all the Stephen King stuff. He they, that's all world building too. It's a little different because you're writing a story and like it is on rails because you write it and there's no there's not like players coming around, but. I just kind of look at what they did, how they named their places, and if I have a place that's similar, I will kind of come up with a name that sounds a little similar to that. Oh, okay. But change it up. I don't want to steal anyone's idea necessarily, but I, yeah. you know, it's inspiration. I want to be able to draw from the things that do inspire me. And if I'm looking for a place that's like a mountain range, maybe I'll go to a video game. Like I really like the game called Cold and Sun for the Game Boy Advance, and I'll go in there and see like, oh, what's the name of all the towns that they have. Oh, I like the towns from these areas. I'm thinking of making a world that's kind of like that. Let me take the name from there and kind of tweak it a little bit and maybe grab another name from somewhere else that has a similar uh, region or area and tweak that a little bit and maybe smash them together or something like that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And then never tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's better than me. I, I blatantly, I'm so bad with names. And I agonize over names, which are like two very bad kind of traits to have. Like not only am I bad at naming, I'm never happy with what I hear. Um, so I just blatantly take names because I know it's not going to matter in our campaign setting. Um, but if I were to say run a game with either people that are very well versed in fantasy, or if I'm doing like, I don't know, like an online stream, like some, some other groups that I see, um, I would not do that. Like I would come up with my own. I would just work really hard to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, if you if you don't feel beholden to uh, coming up with your own stuff, ain't nothing wrong with uh, taking some names and applying with some other things. It's not like you're making money off of it. So, 
Uh, what about you, Jake? Are, are, have you come up with any names? Uh, you know, funny you guys, you brought up the whole mashing together names thing. I kind of had the same thought. I don't, I don't know if I was going to uh, refer to it as a secret, but I was just going to kind of get some names from existing places and kind of switch some, uh, some letters around, you know, as I could just to make it, you know, not so rip ripping it off. Uh, another idea I had was kind of like how with uh, like Cars, the movie, how it's just a world of cars. Everything's cars. Uh, I was going to make my Dino Land have, you know, have, you know, dinosaur oriented names for the towns. Oh, that's, awesome. oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. <laughs> so like something like uh, like Three Horn Plateau would be like where the Triceraborn are from. Or, oh, you know, like nice. just something, yeah. you know, something off the top of my head, like just referring to the fact that there's, you know, this is a world where dinosaurs are. Got you. I like it. That's pretty dope. Yeah, you know, it's it seems like a difficult thing, just the whole creation, because it is just pure creation, this whole world building. So it's just it's kind of you got to rack your brain. You got to get that out. And sometimes the the imagination's not there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the muses are not whispering in your <laughs> yeah. ear. Um, speaking of names, uh, you know, the name of my campaign setting is ASMR. Did you have you guys come up with names for yours? And it's fucking hard. <laughs> uh, actually, um, I did name my world. Its its name is Trask. Uh, it's okay. T R A S K. Oh yeah, you told me. And uh, I was I'm a big hockey fan. I was watching some hockey, oh, and Jesus. there's a there's a goalie in Boston. His <laughs> name is Tuka Rask. And when they write his name on the stat sheets, it's just T Rask. And I was like, there it is. <laughs> oh my god. No one, okay. no one will know. Well, now and the now world knows. Know. Yeah. <laughs> but, what about uh, you, Jake? Please tell me it wasn't the same. <laughs> uh, no, it was. It, well. You know, when I was young, I would read these uh, these book series called Dinotopia. So oh. I didn't I didn't want to take that name, but I wanted it to be something like that. You know, it's some sort of Dinotopia or like I didn't know. Will, yeah, Dino- <laughs> <laughs> something of that nature. Yeah. Like I wanted maybe the I didn't know Will Wheaton's world was like Soria or something like that. I was thinking. I think this world's Volcana, but like the oh, race, well. the race of creatures are, are they're called Saurians, which is just dinosaur. Well, you know, it'll be. Yeah. It'll be something. Like Soranese. That. Yeah. <laughs> Soranopolis. What well, do they know. speak? Do they, <laughs> do they do they speak Sorish? Like, I'm sure the dinosaur born will. That's I mean, you just created the language that they speak yeah. right now. You're, Thank you. you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and then here we go. We're world building right now. Take notes. Yeah, indeed. Um, when it comes to deities, have you guys even tackled that subject for your worlds yet? Um, I do have a creation story. Okay. Um, that's where I started. Okay. Um, so there, there is a very indifferent deity that is the creator of all, and um, he has subjects which are um, the the main pantheon, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. They're um, he's like the All Father, and yes, they're okay. Exactly. That's pretty cool. And uh, he's gonna, they're gonna be. Um, he's the All Father, or well, it's a uh, non-gender uh, creature, but. Um, after after that the next level would be like your more um standard array of D D gods but they'll be um they'll be semi uh immortal um which is to say mortal i guess <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> they they will be killable i'm gonna make uh i'm gonna make that a thing but they're also in another plane and mainly unreachable yeah but they're and i take it they're ageless they don't yes, age right yeah. yes yeah um well as far as i know right now um i mean it could be like they age so damn slowly. It, like a golden compass thing. I don't know if you read that series where like the angels, they like, they do age or like the thing that they call God in that world. Like it, he's just the first of many. And like, he's just so old now over the course of like millions of years. Like it's very slow age. Yeah. Stuff like that where yeah. their age, their age is arbitrary and irrelevant because they live so long, but they do have finite lives and die. Right. And just, like, That's pretty cool. Scale of humanity and, and races in D and D. They might as well be immortal. They might as well be immortal. Yeah. Almost like how a human would look at an elf. Um, but okay. on a much, much bigger scale. Gotcha. Like how the, wor- the life of the world would look at, like you compare a human looking at an elf to the world, looking at the, the all of creation, like, right. Oh, this will all one day die. But like, I will never see it as the world, you know. Right, right. What about you, Jake? Uh, you know, it was something I was actually really worried about. Um, I was worried because it, I don't know if like a creation story would make sense without deities. I don't know how a world or how a D and D world without deities would even work. 
So I don't know. I, I had actually, it was something that was really worrying me or I was racking my brain about how I could do it. I mean, I was thinking maybe about reskinning them um, to make them fit into the world a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I mean, they don't have to be there. You can discount the religious classes. I mean, there's only two really. And just, you know, there, there are no religions. There's no proof that there is or isn't deities and just... Uh, the most mostly it's just martial stuff and uh, magic stuff, so you could do that. That is true as well. Like, you know, I mean, maybe I mean no, no gods, just dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, we're kind of come up to to the end here. So Jake, thanks for thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah appreciate you yeah, being here. Not a problem. Some Anytime. Time. Some great insight. Yeah. All right, everybody. With that, we're gonna call it a game. And I'm really excited for what happens next. You know, I heard that if you're standing within 30 feet of the Sage DM, you have advantage on all of your wisdom checks. Take it away, Sage DM. Hey, everybody. Sage DM here with your Sage DM advice for the week. Now, I live by this one. Remember, don't sweat the petty things. And don't pet the sweaty things. Later. Later.